afternoon. Glad to see y'all here. Uh, I wish your numbers were higher, but it is what it is. I'm glad that y'all are here. Good to see y'all back. It's been a while. Good to be back. So last month, last year, we ended up our chronological study of Suwannee County's history, and now we're looking at topical history of Suwannee County. So the first one is a short history of crime in Suwannee County. I have that viewer discretion advised on here. Sometimes we have kids in here, and just to warn the parents that some of the pictures are not always pleasant. Y'all are all adults, so I'm not so worried with y'all. So, any questions, thoughts, or comments before we begin? None? I, I chose about a dozen or so different things. There are lots of crime. If you go back throughout the entire history of Swanee County, there's a lot of crime. I mean, we have literally thousands of cases of crime in Swanee County that I handle at the courthouse. Um, there's a lot of it. So, I picked out about a dozen or so of the more interesting ones or more well-known ones, and we're going to talk about those for just a few minutes each. But if you want to know more about our crime, you can come to the courthouse and some of the stuff I can show you, some of the stuff I can't. But let's start way back before there was even the United States. And the first one I want to talk about is the Tamuka Rebellion of 1656. Basically, the Tamuka were the Indian group that was here in what's now Suwannee County and the surrounding area when the Spanish arrived in the 1500s. And so by the early 1600s, we've got missionaries, we've got uh, settlements beginning in the interior of Florida including Suwannee County. We had several mission sites, which we've talked about in a previous presentation. But we have several mission sites, and uh, these Indian, the Tamuqua Indian, are being used by the Spanish to do a lot of labor, a lot of heavy labor, those kinds of things. Florida was a very poor colony of Spain, and so they didn't have the manpower that some of their other colonies had. So they had to use, uh, they relied heavily on the Indian groups, the Native Americans in the area. And again, Tamuka being the one here. And so for many years, they would push these folks to work not only locally, but more so over in St. Augustine, which was one of the capitals of Florida at that time. Pensacola was the other. And so they would send a lot of the interior Indians to those two sites, those two cities, if you will, to, to work on fortifications, uh, building government buildings, those <coughs> kinds of things. And so that was really exasperating the issue that the Indians were having with population. They were already dying off from the diseases that the New World had been brought over to. Uh, they're also dying because of warfare between the Spanish and the English and the Dutch and all those, the French that are trying to, to take over basically North America. And so all these things are leading to a population decrease. And it doesn't help that half the year pretty much, all of your men pretty much, uh, in, your, in your village, all the able-bodied men are sent off, you know, 100 miles away, that's not going to help the population either. So uh, gradually as things happen, 1656, there is the possibility of an English attack on St. Augustine, and so the governor of Spanish Florida, uh, Governor Robiego, calls up the local militia, which includes a lot of the Native Americans. And... Uh, some of them decide, we don't want to do that. And so they actually start a rebellion, the Tamuka Rebellion of 1656. So there are a few massacres related to it. One of them is in Suwannee County. There's still discussion as to, to where exactly it was. Um, some folks think it was probably around Royal Springs, down in the south part of our county. But there were some travelers coming from the, uh, what's now Payne's Prairie, that used to be the La Chula, farm way back when, but some of the folks from that area were coming up and, and staying, again, probably around Royal Springs, and they were up late one night, they were just, you know, sitting there, lying there, chatting, and some of these Tamuco Indians come in and kill them. One of them was named Francisco Vasquez, he was a Spanish, and then the other Indian that was killed was Geronimo, not the famous Geronimo that everybody knows about, but a different Geronimo, and so they, they, they were killed, they were scalped, all that good stuff. Um, Seven people in all were killed by the Tamuka Rebellion. So it was not a bloody rebellion, if you will, but it was an issue. At the time, though, the governor could not do anything about it. He was too busy trying to prepare for the English attack. But eventually, within a couple months, the weather changed. It became hurricane season. The English decided we're not going to go to attack. 
And so then the governor could turn his attention to those rebels, who when they found out about uh, the governor's intentions, kind of pretty much holed up in Madison County, or what is now Madison County. And so there was a lot of discussions, negotiations back and forth, and they eventually decided, all right, we will surrender without a fight. And so the governor took the caciques, or caciques, however you want to pronounce that, the village chiefs of a lot of the rebellious villages, which mainly were in Suwannee County, and took them and executed them in various methods, usually garroting and stuff like that. Um, they imprisoned a few others that were the lesser ones, and pretty much what the Spanish did was got rid of the hierarchy of the villages in, in this area and replaced the chiefs or the caciques or caciques with somebody that was pro-Spanish. Like, all right, well, we don't like you, get rid of you, kill you, or imprison you at the very least, and we're gonna put somebody else in charge that does the way, the things that we want to do. So that was a rebellion of sorts, some folks were killed, and again, most of the Indians that were executed in it were from Swanee County, what is now Swanee County. So that's one of the earlier issues going on. Uh, you could almost go back even further than that with uh, crime in Swanee County and talk about when Hernando and Soto came through the 1500s when he was coming through this area and they had the Battle of uh, Napatook, a battle of two lakes, two ponds. Uh, he wiped out all the Indians that had surrendered after that, so all the male anyway, Indians. So, so even before there was the United States, there was crime in Suwannee County that was happening. But moving forward a little bit to our American territorial history, the Second Seminole War began in 1835, the very end of 1835, and a lot of the fighting was in North and Central Florida, more Central Florida than North Florida. But there were several battles, there were several, in our case, in Suwannee County, several massacres that happened. Uh, one of them was uh, the family of William Clemens in 1837, basically after the threat of the Seminole Indians had kind of died off a little bit. Uh, when it was the threat, pretty much the settlers would go to several forts whether it was Lower Mineral Springs, White Springs, down in Gain what's now Gainesville, uh, which was Fort Noonansville, different forts, even in Lake, what's now Lake City. The settlers would pretty much just jam-pack themselves into these small forts, and there really wasn't a lot to much of these forts. Uh, but they basically fortified themselves together. But then once the threat kind of died off a little bit, the families got tired of being cooped up, so they decided to kind of go back home and kind of rebuild their lives. And so William Clemens was one of those uh, families. Could be Clements, Clemens, there's several ways to spell it, but usually Clemens is what I see it as. And I know there are Clemens even here today in Swanee County. So in 1837, uh, they leave where they had been staying at the, the fort in Swanee Springs, go back home to an area between Live Oak and Welburn, and he brings his wife and his kids and gets them all settled. Then he goes back to the fort to gather more stuff. Well, pretty much as soon as uh, they're out of earshot, uh, he's out of earshot, the Indians come and attack and massacre his family. Uh, pretty bad. So that's one of the massacres. Same year, 1837, we have the Sykes Massacre. And author Sykes was one of our early Swanee County settlers. He was here by 1831. I found records showing that he was here at least by 1831. And he lived in the north part of the county. It actually shows Sykes there in the middle of that map, um, just about three miles to the west of Swanee Mineral Springs. Or, yeah, Swanee Mineral Springs, then Lower Mineral Springs, which is now called Swanee Springs. But uh, he lived on what was the old Stagecoach Road at the time, which you can see it, that road on the top. Uh, that's now partly County Road 132, Stagecoach Road. That's why it's called Stagecoach Road, because it was the old stagecoach. Well, uh, his son-in-law, who was James Smiley, was a lieutenant in one of the local militia groups. And they were stationed pretty much at Swanee Springs. Most of the group was sent away to, to deal with the Indians in a different location, but Lieutenant Smiley was part of a contingent that stayed behind. Well, his father-in-law lived just three miles down the road, uh, Lieutenant Smiley had at least one child at this point, and he had a spouse, so he would go visit his in-laws and his family at the Sykes residence between his work over at uh, the fort. So go back and forth. Well, on the afternoon of January 24th, 1837, 
author sites is shucking corn uh, in a corn crib along with his young grandchild, which is Lieutenant Smiley's son. Um, they hear the war whoop of the Seminole Indians. And so they run back into uh, the house. They gather up some of the servants they've got and other children. They pretty much rush in and get everybody they can go to the house. Author Sykes has seven loaded guns in his house. And so he starts shooting. Meanwhile, he's got his family and his servants reloading for him. So it looks like there's a lot more than really one guy shooting from the house. Um, and he, this happens all afternoon, most of the evening, into the night. And he is shooting by the fires that the Seminole Indians have started burning his corn crib down, those kinds of things. So he's just shooting when he sees them. Uh, eventually, as the night goes on, he realizes he's got to do something because it's really just him shooting and his wife and kids and servants. And so what he does is he pries up one of the boards of this house, the floor of the house uh, that he's in. He has one of his black female servants strip naked and sends her crawling on all fours outside. His thought was, in the darkness, she might be mistaken for a pig. So I'm not sure what that says about her, how she looked, but you know maybe they'll think she's a pig and let her go. And that's apparently what happened. The Seminole Indians didn't notice her. She was able to get to Swanee Springs, alert the, the soldiers there, and so they came in and they basically made the Indians leave. Um, when the morning was revealed and Sykes was able to get out, he found Lieutenant Smiley, uh, his son-in-law, was dead. He had been killed in the initial attack. He'd been out chopping wood about 150 yards away. Um, so he was killed. Now, Jacob Rettmont, who was an army surgeon, and he wrote a book called Journey into Wilderness. And it's basically about his time in the American army during the Second Civil War. And a part of that book, he's talking about this very thing. And let's see if I can find exactly. Yeah, here it is. On the uh, afternoon of January 25th, 1837, he and his men were ordered to what is now Swanee County to pursue a large party of Seminoles that the day before had attacked the Sykes home. He called it Old Man Sykes Home in his uh, presentation. They arrived the next night. They just were not able to find them because they'd already taken off. The, the, the Seminole Indians were very good about hit, hit and runs, guerrilla warfare. Go in, attack where nobody is, and then run off before you've got organized resistance. But Mott talks about uh, going to this house and stuff. Now, I was going through some records last year, and this is one of these things where I learn stuff sometimes that I had no clue about. Um, in finding some of the old land grants, way before we were Swanee County, they were recorded after we became a county in one of the books I just happened to be inventorying last year and going through. And when I saw his name, I realized, okay, I recognize who that name is. Where was his house located? And come to find out, it was basically across the street from where I've lived most of my life, where I grew up and where I lived until last year when we moved, um, more or less. Pretty much most of my life was diagonal across the street from where this massacre apparently took place. You never know. So uh, very interesting, very interesting. My family's been on that property for 75 plus years. There we go, across from an Indian massacre from the Second Civil War. So you never know, you never know. The last known, or the one that I've been able to find anyway, known Seminole Massacre, took place in 1842. 1842. And it was in the Welburn area, and it was against the family of uh, Richard, his nickname was Dick Tillis. He's sometimes listed as Tullis, but Tillis was his name. So Dick Tillis, uh, his family uh, was pretty much, most of them were massacred. He was off helping build a house with some neighbors, which neighbors back then could be two or three miles away. So he was off building a house for somebody, and uh, the Indians attacked, Seminoles attacked his family and massacred a bunch of them. And his, there's the, the writing, and I'll just read it to you. And this is from George McClellan. George McClellan lived in the Welburn area. He was a very early settler of Swanee County. He was a politician, businessman. He was in the militia, uh, lots of different things. Uh, but it says Little River, which was what Welburn used to be called, basically. Columbia County, which is what we were part of. East Florida is the EF on there. February 28, 1842. To His Excellency R.K. Call, Governor of Florida. Sir, it is with feelings, I'll just look at it from here. It is with feelings of deepest regret that I am compelled to inform you 
one of the most barbarous acts of Indian depredation. On Tuesday last, or Thursday, excuse me, Thursday last at noon, seven or eight Indians were discovered a half to three fourths of a mile of my house, making towards a neighboring house. I immediately sent a runner to that house to apprise them and through the neighborhood for the same purpose. But before the news could reach around a Mr. Richard Tully, as I was listening here, about two miles from me, he being absent on business, fell victims in their, uh, to their bar barbarity in the following distressing manner. The lady, Mrs. T, was shot dead. A young lady who was staying there attempted to run off with Mrs. T's infant, two weeks old, but was run after by an Indian, overtaken, knocked down with the limb of a tree, and stabbed under each arm, or nearly so, to the hollow. She is yet alive. A little girl, eight years old, was shot with an arrow in the back, a bar or spike made of iron, severing off part of the bone and lodging under a rib. She died last night. A little boy, six years old, was shot with an arrow in the back near the bone and came out near the navel. He is yet alive. The next oldest was killed dead with an arrow, and the next oldest, a boy, was shot through the body and died on Friday night. All of the children were shot and the arrows left in them, except the infant, infant which was not interrupted. The house was stripped and the Indians made their escape. I pursued them the next day with 24 men, but did not overtake them until they had crossed the swine. And on the opposite bank they were discovered, but out of gunshot and no possibility of crossing the river. Thus were we disappointed of revenge. The steamboat that came after the troops at Fort Macomb, which was further down on the Swanee River, as I am told on its return discovered, or the men on her saw Indian rafts on this side of the river and neither destroyed them, pursued the Indian, nor informed us of it. However, Major Rains at Fort White came with the doctor from that fort to see the wounded of Tully's family and promised to all he in his power for us. On receiving information of this murder, he sent for aid to Camp Fanning, which is close to where Fanning Springs is today, and a company of dragoons were immediately, or as soon as possible, uh, and returned to Camp F, which was again Camp Fanning, to recross the river and come up after them. But alas, it was too late. They could not, I fear, overtake them. Yesterday, about 10 in the morning, they made an attack on Mr. Osteen's house one and a half miles from the natural bridge on the Santa Fe River, killed Mrs. O, and was still firing on the house when the express left for Alligator. Alligator is now Lake City. The particulars of this transaction are yet to be learned. I fear the worst. I start off again tomorrow after them. Signs were discovered within a few miles of this one day since. Unless we get aid speedily, this county or this country, excuse me, must be abandoned. Not a soldier is on the frontier of the country except at Fort White leaving Santa Fe and Swanee free for them to live on. This is protection. I have stated this much that you may be pushing the important matters in the vicinity. I'm going to hear from you soon. I am, sir, your being servant, George E. McClellan. So he was not too happy with the governor and with the army because they were basically leaving uh, this area more or less defenseless, just leaving it up to certain militia members like himself. So uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, most of these, these kids died. A couple of them survived. Even the boy that was shot through the navel, he survived and fought in the Civil War. His name was Jimmy, uh, but he did survive. Um, it's just another massacre, unfortunately. Sad thing with uh, Dick Tullis is, or Tillis, this was his second wife. This was actually uh, the sister of his first wife. His first wife had died apparently in childbirth, so he married her sister, and then she gets killed along with most of their kids. So um, they are all buried in a cemetery there in Welburn one of the old cemeteries in the Welburn area. So, uh, you know, Seminole Massacres. That's George McClellan who tried to hunt down those Indians, those Seminoles, to no avail. So lots of Seminole Massacres. Another thing taking place, another event taking place, deals with Rebecca Charles. And this is after the Second Seminole War. Now the Charles family, Reuben and Rebecca Charles, were the first known American settlers in Swanee County. They were here by 1824. Uh, Reuben Charles established a trading post across the Swanee River. There was an inn and a ferry. They lived at what's now Charles Spring. It's named after that family. So he established a, a business presence here very early on. And uh, Reuben himself was killed either 1835 or 1836, depends on which record you look at. But it looks like he was killed while walking along the Swanee River, probably by a Native American. The interesting thing is with the Charles, they were one of the few white folks that were friendly to the Seminoles. 
pretty much all the rest of them were they're savages. We don't want to deal with them. We just want to kill them. But Ruben and Rebecca Charles, they were friendly. They were on friendly terms with them. And there was this legendary stipulation uh, that you read about in the history books and stuff that um, they would be recognized by having like a red scarf or, or kerchief or something around them to show, hey, that's the Charles family. We're not going to shoot them. I joked that he was killed by a colorblind Indian who didn't, couldn't tell it was red. But that's just me joking. I don't know. But he was killed. Uh, the wife continued to run the inn and the ferry crossing for several years. Well, in 1852, January 25th, she was standing on her front porch and she was shot and killed. Don't know who it was. The Seminoles had been pushed out of here by this point. They had moved to Central and South Florida. So it was not a Seminole that killed them. And again, why would they? Because they were friendly terms with them. So there's a thought that it might have been one of the settlers that didn't get along with them or was upset that they had been friendly to the Seminoles during the war. Don't know how or why. But she was killed. Her grave and her husband's grave were still there just um, southeast of Charles Springs. Their daughter also was killed by a Seminole Indian because she rushed out one day to, prior to Mrs. Charles' death during the Second Seminole War, uh, she rushed out to the stagecoach to get the mail and uh, she didn't have her kerchief or scarf, whatever it was, that showed that she was one of the Charles family. And so one of the Seminoles shot and killed her. Uh, she was just a teenager at the time. So they're all buried out at Charles Springs. So yet another, and that one was an unsolved murder because we don't know uh, who killed Rebecca Charles. So moving ahead a couple decades almost, or a decade from Rebecca Charles' death in 1852, we get to the Civil War. And we had a few things happening around the Civil War, but the criminal part I want to bring up is this young man here, Lewis Gordon Powell. He was born in, uh, and lived most of his life in Hamilton County in 1859, I believe. The family moved to Swanee County. His dad, George Powell, was a preacher. And so he preached in different locations, but they moved to Swanee County in 1859. When the war came in 1861, Lewis was 17 years old. He was too young, technically, to enlist, but he did anyway and joined up with the Hamilton Blues, which was at the time the closest unit, I guess, to him uh, on the north part of town, north part of Swanee County. So he joined up. He served for a couple of years. He was wounded and captured at Gettysburg and taken back to be nursed back to health. And what it looks like happened is a female nurse kind of fell in love with him and helped him escape. So he was now out and about in the north part of the country, technically the United States, no longer in the south. And he goes around and he finds a guerrilla unit, uh, Mosby's Rangers, and he joins up with them, which they were a southern guerrilla group, I mean, basically military, but, but they did some of that guerrilla warfare. And um, so he joined them for a while, did some things with them. Um, there are suggestions that he might have joined the Confederate Secret Service. I've read that in places, but I haven't seen any proof. But it, it's thrown out there, so I'm throwing it out to y'all. Well, uh, he's up north, milling about, and 1865 comes around. The war is obviously going to be lost by the South. Uh, well, he comes in contact with a famous actor of the day, and this actor helps him out with some food and stuff, and uh, he's enamored with him because, I mean, it's a famous actor. Who wouldn't be if a famous actor came to you and helped you out? So basically Lewis says, hey, if you need me for anything, let me know. Well, the actor gets back to him and says, you know what? Me and some of my friends, we're, we're, we're getting together a little thing that we're going to do. We want to, to help out the South. So we want to capture President Lincoln. And we want to hold him for ransom so that he will release uh, many of our troops that are imprisoned up north in bad conditions. And uh, so this actor, who you would know as John Wilkes Booth, and some of his other friends and other folks, including Lewis Thornton Powell, get this idea up. And then they decide, you know what, maybe we should just poison Lincoln, do something else to him. But then it was like, let's just kill him. And let's not just kill him, but a few other folks. Some of those that have, that have done so much damage to the Confederate cause. Well, this is in April of, 16, of 1865. The war basically is over. Lee surrenders, that's the main, main army unit for the South. You still got little armies out and about, but for the most part, the war is over. 
and uh, they agree to go kill Lincoln, Secretary of State William Seward, and a couple of other folks that have been involved um, with the war. Andrew Johnson, Vice President, those kinds of things. And so John Wilkes Booth goes to Ford Theater, and while an Our American Cousin is being performed, he you know, shoots Lincoln, jumps off the stage, breaks his leg, yells Six Emperor Tyrannus, and runs away, or hobbles away, I guess better to put. And he is chased down, hunted down, and killed eventually. <coughs> Lewis Thornton Powell, at the same time, he's now 21. He goes to where Secretary of State William Seward is recovering from a carriage accident. And he knocks on the door late at night, saying he's an errand boy for the doctor. They don't recognize him, but he eventually forces his way in. He pulls out a gun and a knife. The gun misfires, so he's using it to bash people over the head, um, including one of Seward's sons, who has to have a metal plate put in his head because of it. And he starts slicing and dicing away with his knife. He manages to, to stab Seward. He was trying to cut his neck. But because of the carriage accident, he's got some bandages around his neck. So the, the bandages deflect the knife and it actually stabs him in the cheek. And then he rolls off the bed and rolls under it. And meanwhile, other people are coming in, rushing to his assistance. So Lewis Thornton Powell runs out screaming that I'm mad, I'm mad, and runs off. And he hides in a cemetery for a day or so, and then goes back to the home of Mary Surratt, which is where they had been meeting, uh, he and the other folks had been meeting to plan out everything. As it turns out, the other folks, uh, Harold and Azerholt, the other two gentlemen, they pretty much just chicken out and go get drunk and don't do anything. But they are all arrested. They are all very quickly found guilty. Within three months, basically, uh, they are found guilty, and their sentences are being carried out. And uh, so they're being hanged, including Mary Surratt, who may or may not have even known what's going on. That's a question for other folks, but, but that has been going on for 150 years plus. <coughs> is, did she really know about this, or were they hanging her because they couldn't find her son, who had absconded to Canada by this point? But anyway, um, Lewis Thornton Powell was very stoic with everything. The newspapers, when they were writing about this whole case, wrote more about him than anybody else except for Mary, uh, Mary Surratt because she was pretty much the first woman that was about to be executed by the federal government. But they wrote about him. There's been books written about him. There's been a couple movies that he's been referenced into or part of the movie. <clears throat> but he has executed, this is July of 1865. So it happens in April, May, June, July. I mean, basically three months later, we're done. He, he's done, he's executed. Now, his father is still here in Swanee County. He's still a minister, still preaching, still marrying people. And he finds out that his son is in trouble. So he tries to go up to Washington, D.C., which is where the hanging takes place. He gets sick. He doesn't make it in time. So he does not get to see his, his son before his execution. Eventually, the body is exhumed from Washington and brought down to Florida. Now, in 1866, George Powell, his father, moved from Swanee County down to Seminole, what's now Seminole County, that area, uh, to go preach. I don't know because the stigma attached with having a son that tried to kill the president, or if he just saw better opportunities down in Seminole County, in that area. But regardless, they moved down there. The body's exhumed and buried with the family. And that was it until 1994, when a person was going through the Smithsonian going through some Indian exhibits and they found a skull that basically was Lewis Thornton Powell's skull. Somebody had taken it as a souvenir and stuck it away. And so in 1994, they actually buried the rest of it with his body. So another crime related to Swanee County since he lived here. All right, the Civil War ends. We have an influx of Northerners coming into Swanee County, including the Parsley family, John and Nancy Parsley, moved to Live Oak. Pretty much Live Oak is today what it is because of the Parsley family. They, they laid out a lot of the streets. That's why we have an Ohio Avenue, because they were from Ohio. Well, Massachusetts, New York, lastly Ohio, and then they came down to Florida. So that's why we have an Ohio Avenue, because of that family. Wilbur Street, 
partially, I mean, lots of streets are named that. Howard Street, named after one of their sons. So uh, they laid out downtown life as we know it today. Well, John partially died a couple years later, uh, after the war. So he only lived here about a year. And uh, Nancy partially picked up where he had left off. Now, Nancy partially was a very educated woman. Uh, she was apparently the one that had all the money. Her husband had gained and lost a fortune or two already. She had a lot of business sense. And so she ran his businesses. And one of the things that happened was, uh, before John partially had died, he had contracted out with the current clerk of the court at that time, who was Nelson Connor, for whom Connor Street's named, there by the, the railroad, um, had contracted with him to have the courthouse, the county site, moved from Houston, where it was, to Live Oak. And uh, part of that contract involved uh, Nelson Connor being given a few deeds to downtown Live Oak property. If he would get the county seat moved to Live Oak, it, it would be across the street from the Connor, the, the Parsley's house, and if he would build a courthouse on that site. So Nelson Connor helps to get the county seat moved in 1868 from Houston to Live Oak, and they look at the Parsley site, which was across the street from the house, where the bank is today. That was the Parsley residence, basically. But he doesn't build a courthouse. He lets the county rent out the, the First Baptist Church, and eventually they buy it and move it, and it gets blown down in a storm because he didn't properly secure it. So Nelson Connor is a businessman. He's also a preacher, and it also looks like he's a swindler because what happens is he goes to Mrs. Parsley and tells her, I want the deeds. I basically want my deeds paid off. I want you to kind of wipe away that, that uh, charge for those deeds because I did pretty much what your husband wanted. And she said, no, because you didn't build a courthouse. He says, all right, fine. I am going to blackmail you by sharing the agreement, the written agreement that John Parsley and I wrote. We're going to share that in the newspapers, and we're going to tell everybody that y'all were instrumental in getting the county seat moved to Lyman. And oh, yeah, right across from your house. So um, this is a back and forth. She ends up being in tears and hands over the deeds to the property. All right, it's yours. And then she uh, comes to the clerk to the courthouse and in the clerk's office and files a lawsuit. Well, he is clerk of the court. He is my predecessor, my, my boss's predecessor. What is one of the things you do as clerk of the court? You handle court records. So she basically comes in to file a lawsuit against him into his office. Surprisingly, he files it. He, he does, it does everything. It still exists today which I'm kind of surprised. But it gets filed, and in the long run, he loses the case. He has to pay up the equivalent of $50,000 today uh, to Mrs. Parshley. Um, lots of different stuff. Lots of stuff. So that happens. He has to pay up. It all comes out in the wash, what's going on. Seems like it might have been a big stink. Mr. Connor died within a year. Maybe because of all that, he looks like he lost his hotel as part of it. Also, he had a hotel on Connor Street. Looks like he lost that as part of it, too. So he lost a lot of stuff because of those three lots that he got. So blackmail involved in some of our crimes. Well, this era is an era of reconstruction. You all probably know a little bit about it. <clears throat> Lots of bad things happening, not just in Swanee County, not just in Florida, but all over the South. The Ku Klux Klan becomes prevalent. First Ku Klux Klan becomes prevalent and other things like it. Uh, eventually a study is commissioned by the federal government and in 1871 they write up several books and uh, most of the states get their own book. Florida did it. It's miscellaneous in Florida because we were the least populated of the southern states during the war. So they basically write up about some of the stuff going on and the Florida Secretary of State who is Jonathan Gibbs He's a black man at that time. This one of those that was put into office um, because of the overthrow of slavery and all these different amendments. Um, one of the carpetbaggers, people that came from up north, he came down and he was put in as Secretary of State. And he told the commission about the numbers of murders he knew about. So the, here, there's his numbers. <clears throat> Lafayette County had four. Taylor County had seven. 
Hamilton County had nine, Suwannee County had 10, Columbia County had 16, Alachua County had 16, Madison County had 20. Then he talked about Jackson County, Mariana area, had 153. So they pretty much had more than everybody else combined. So pretty bad to be in Jackson County in the 1860s and 70s. But he talks about some of the things happening. He talks about, uh, well, in fact, the Madison County Sheriff says, we didn't have 20, we've had 37 over here in Madison County. Uh, Columbia County Sheriff has run out of town. A lot of Republican politicians are scared to run off or kill. Even in Swanee County, going through our existing records, there's a bunch of politicians that don't finish their term. They're, they're gone, they've left. Even one of our sheriffs um, is gone at one point. So lots of political issues going on, lots of murders. One of them happens down in Lafayette County. And basically the judge there, who is Judge John, Dr. John Newton Criminger, he was a Republican judge. He had been a union sympathizer in the war. He basically was one of those flip sides, you know, depending on who was winning. But he was able to stay in office. And he removed J.C. or John Punchier, who was the clerk of the court in Lafayette County, removed him from office because he was a Confederate sympathizer. And then Criminger put his son-in-law in as a clerk. So that didn't go over too well with Mr. Ponchier. And so um, one day, October 5th, 1871, Judge Criminger is sitting on his porch and Ponchier shot him from the courthouse, the Lafayette County Courthouse, and then took off. The issue is how it relates to Swanee County is, as you read through the subcommittee uh, testimony, you find out that J.C. Ponchier had a lot of friends over in Swanee County. So he kind of stayed around Lafayette County until they started hunting for him. Then he'd come over to Swanee County and hold up with some of his friends. So he had lots of friends here. Eventually, the law catches up to him. And in 1873, he is killed close to Dead Man's Bay. Um, and here's what it says from the Savannah Morning News of July 25th. Quoting the Tallahassee Sentinel, it says, John C. Ponchier was killed on the 5th instant at Dead Man's Bay by Mark Stevens, a merchant at that place. Ponchier was once sheriff, so this says sheriff, other sources say clerk. He might have been both. That happened a lot back then. Uh, he was once sheriff of Lafayette County in 1871. He shot Senator Cominger at New Troy. It will be remembered that he lay all night in the courthouse and shot Cominger from a window as Cominger sat on his porch early in the morning. Ponchier fled into the dense hammocks in the lower part of Taylor and Lafayette counties and there defied the sheriff and his posse. He was always well armed, and on one or two occasions, when they came up with him, he stopped got behind the log and beckoned them to come on, which invitation they prudently declined. He has long been noted as a desperate character. At the time of his death, he was 60 years of age. So he had friends over here that helped him throughout the next couple of years before he was killed around Dead Man's Bay. So, you know, not, not a lot of good things happening during the Reconstruction era. <clears throat> but we got past it. We moved on. I keep accidentally bumping the back button. So, lots of murders are going on, some race related, some not, but one of them I want to bring up is the murder of Cat Allen. He was a local businessman, and there's an indication that he may, may have been uh, a criminal. Um, one of the stories is that he robbed trains. So, I'm not sure how accurate that is, but I've heard that, so I'm throwing it out. But Cat Allen, in 1897, he was in his bed. He had one of his kids sleeping with him, and somebody pointed a shotgun from the window and shot him, killed him, and maimed the uh, son. And that son carried the scars the rest of his life. Well, they think maybe there's a few with one of the local folks, and that's how it happened. But the interesting thing about this is Mr. Allen, even if he was a criminal, had enough local friends that the county commission put up um, a reward, a hundred dollar reward for any information leading to the arrest. Now that was about four thousand dollars today. County commission put up for this reward. Now the funny thing is, when you check the the board, of the county commissioner's bank account at that time, which we have records of, they only had two hundred dollars in the bank, so they just put up one <coughs> half of what they had to find this guy's murder. Not only that, but the governor put up a hundred dollars. So, um, interesting. 
To my knowledge, nobody was ever arrested. I haven't been able to find it anyway, but um, it's very interesting. One of his descendants came in probably 10 or 15 years ago, and I was trying to help him do research, and we found these kind of records, but um, not if the trial was ever held for somebody that was arrested. So, don't know. Could be another one of those murders for which we don't have all the details. Uh, just the, the interesting thing was the, the board put up, hey, half of our money, find the guy that killed it. So we had friends in high places, apparently. But that is part of the minutes. The board, having learned of the foul murder of Cat Allen, uh, which occurred near O'Brien in the county, uh, or in this county, on the night of December 2nd, 1997, and whereas, blah, 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 I kept talking about, we're going to put up $100. So kind of funny. <clears throat> A couple years later, we've got a doctor being killed. Not the last one I'm talking about today. Dr. W.S. Eric, one of the Eric family. He is shot and killed by Eugene Davis on June 29th, 1900. He is shot on the 29th. He dies on July 1st in Atlanta, where he has been taken for surgery uh, to see if they could help him. Now, um, this case I brought up because what happened was Eugene Davis, the murderer, his wife had been a patient of Dr. Eric, and she had died the year before. So he never forgave Dr. Eric, said, I'm going to kill you one day. I'm, I'm going to come, and I'm going to get you. If you ever cross my path, you're dead. So as the story goes, as the, the records show, on June 29th, Davis consumed a generous amount of alcohol, and then he went looking for Dr. Eric. Uh, Dr. Erith was not at his drugstore, so Davis waited for him. So eventually, Dr. Erith came to his drugstore. Erith walked in through the back door and walked behind the counter. He had a friendly conversation with Mr. Davis. Everything sounds okay. Dr. Erith then walked to the other end of the counter to get a cigar from a cigar case, and then Davis followed on the other side of the counter. So there's the <coughs> counter, they're talking, he walks down, uh, Dr. Erith walks down to get his cigar, Davis walks down, and then when Dr. Eric pulled out the cigar, Davis shot him two times as he attempted to duck behind the counter. So it was not uh, successful. And then Davis came back and shot him again, just for you know, making sure. At the same, same time, he's yelling uh, that Dr. Eric had killed his wife, and now he killed him. So Eugene Davis was arrested and found guilty of that murder. So he was caught, he was sentenced. So Dr. Harris, that's one of the Earth family that we still have somewhere around today, one of his relatives. So, late 1800s, early 1900s, you don't have national databases, you don't have fingerprinting really, you don't have DNA for sure. So lots of people come here to get away from things. We're still rural, although Live Oak is becoming one of the largest cities in the state. The rest of the county is pretty rural. And so a lot of people come here to get away from things. And so when you go through our records, a lot of them are ones you find everywhere. You're just going to find them. But then we've got a few other things, things like larceny of hogs and cows, breaking and entering. One of the, the funny things is, as you go through our records, there's a lot of them that are charges for having a house of ill repute. So uh, I guess we had our, more than our fair share of prostitutes and uh, brothels, if you will. But one of the other things is bigamy. There's a bunch of bigamy going on. And I found this years ago, and I thought it was funny, so I, so I like to put it in this. Is bigamy, <laughs> according to Oscar Wilde, bigamy is having one wife too many. Monogamy is the same for Oscar Wilde. <laughs> so uh, it's funny. But yeah, bigamy was apparently an issue here. And people would get arrested and charged with bigamy. They were already married, and they came here and married somebody else. And somebody finds out and reports them. And so they get arrested and charged, those kinds of things. Another thing that you see a lot of is, uh, would not be politically correct today, but basically you are charged with having sex with an imbecile. My wife could probably be charged with that. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of those kind of things, uh, you know, having sex with different words. They use imbecile. They sometimes use retard, different, different words like that. Uh, basically taking advantage of a mentally uh, incompetent person. And um, I've got a story to go with that probably 15 years ago now, maybe almost 20. 
I had some folks coming down, and they wanted to do some family history research. Okay, yeah, no problem. And so they wanted to look up more about their dear uncle so-and-so. And so we're going through, we're pulling records, and it's like, oh, your dear uncle so-and-so, that was one of his charges, was basically taking advantage of a mentally incompetent person. And they, they basically were like, I don't want to know anything else. I don't know more. I'm done. <laughs> and that's what people do sometimes. They say, I want, to believe, I want to think of them as I remember them, not the criminal they really were. Some people want to keep on. All right, tell me what all you've got. A lot of these cases, I found out about them because family came in asking for information and doing research. And I've got a few more coming up in a minute. It was because people requested it. Hey, I know my so-and-so killed somebody or did this or that. I want to know more. Some of the folks like this one was, we don't want to know anymore, and we're done. We're done. Thank you very much for your time. My dear uncle so-and-so is going to stay dear uncle so-and-so in my memory. So we do have that. Uh, we also had during this time, unfortunately, several race-related uh, issues, uh, including some murders. I actually have a photograph that I don't usually show, but it is of a lynching. It, the description on it says at the courthouse, but they've lynched the person. There's lots of trees around. I think it's in the woods somewhere. That would make more sense than lynching at the courthouse downtown Live Oak. But it shows the lynched uh, young black male and a bunch of white folks, you know, kind of like a trophy thing. I mean, it, it, it's sad. It's, it's different times, but it's sad. But, you know, I've got those kinds of things in our records also. Around 1906, the original Swanee Democrat building, wooden building, burned. Um, that was unfortunate because we lost the first so many years, of, uh, the first 20 years basically, of the Swanee Democrats records. Other than a few scattered ones like these I've got here at the clerk's office, uh, those, either the entire newspaper or part of them were submitted as uh, paperwork that our office needed. So we've got parts of them going back before 1906-ish but it's few and far between. I think the oldest time that's 1885, before it was even a Democrat. But apparently what happened was, the fire started in a wastebasket one night. And it's very interesting, it cannot be proven conclusively, but earlier that day, the publisher was fired. And he was forcibly removed by the printer from the building. So you're out of here, you're out of this building, push them out. And about the same time the fire was detected, that same publisher fled town on a train. So it may just be circumstance, but it seems to indicate he might have set the fire and then took off. So it burned up, and that's very unfortunate because we lost a lot of history uh, of the records. Again, other than a few like this that I've got, we don't have the early years of the Democrats. It's only a Democrat. And we'll talk about the Democrat later on, too. Moving ahead a couple decades, we've got... The Burnett Musgrove Shootout. <clears throat> distant Ken, distant Ken. Um, this story was told to me by some family members years ago, and I also read about it and found out more about it. But basically, Arch Burnett was not a good man. He was, uh, it was his way or you die kind of thing. He was known for shooting people and killing people. He had lots of friends in high places, so he was not charged for a long time with any of them. He eventually was charged and convicted, but then put out on parole. And what happened was his son and Corbett Musgrove's son got into a scuffle at the school, and it spilled over to the parents. And so Arch Burnett, in 1934, he went to where Corbett Musgrove worked with his dad, Jim, and other folks, at the barber shop, pretty much across the street from the courthouse, and called them out. And Corbett Musgrove and his dad, Jim Musgrove, were ready for him, pulled out their guns. There was a shooting, uh, a downtown shootout, right there by the courthouse. And uh, Arch Burnett was killed. A few stories related to that. I knew somebody who was a student at one of the Live Oak schools. And at the time, all the Live Oak schools were within a block of the courthouse. And so they remembered in 1934 not being able to get out, in the, get out of school because there was a dead body in the street. It was Arch Burnett's. Uh, so they had to wait. They got out late because of that. 
Another one of the stories is from J.L. McMullen, who used to be the clerk of the court. And at this time, he worked at the courthouse. Um, if he was not clerk of the court yet, he was working for the court. And he told me before he passed away years ago that he remembers watching that shootout from the top floor of the courthouse where his office was, which at the time was where I had an office. And he was looking down and watching it all transpire. So very interesting to hear about that. But um, it was big news, and this is with the newspaper, and I'll read it to you, because it'll give you a little bit more background and irony in some of it too. So it says, Live Oak Floor, October 16th, Arch Burnett, paroled life term convict, was shot and killed yesterday in an open gun battle in front of a downtown barber shop. Sheriff Joe Heinley, who was in Tallahassee at the time, obtained papers to have Burnett remanded to prison for violation of his parole. Said the ex-convict was shot down by two Musgrove brothers and their father, proprietors of the barber shop. At a coroner's inquest, which was continued until today, I only said it was testified the shooting occurred over an altercation between the Musgroves and Burnett. Witnesses, the sheriff said, testified Burnett appeared suddenly in the doorway of the barber shop and discharged a shotgun at the Musgroves. All three, neither of whom were hit. That's incorrect grammar, but should have been none of whom were hit. Returned the fire, the witnesses said, and Burnett fell dead. Sheriff Hindley said it was brought out in the hearing that Burnett last week held a son of one of the Musgroves, while his own son and nephew beat the youth. Witnesses, the sheriff said, also testified Burnett was drunk when he came downtown yesterday bearing the gun. The Musgroves, James Musgrove, the father, Corbett, one of the sons, and the other son, whose name was not immediately learned, were at liberty tonight under bonds. Sheriff Hindley was in the office of Governor Schultz when a telephone call informed him of the shooting. He said Burnett had been in trouble, violating his parole since the release April 1st. Funny part is Burnett had served 16 months of a life sentence for secondary murder. Officers, officers and prominent Suwannee County citizens signed the petition for his release. So either they were scared of him or he had dirt on him or he just had friends in high places that were able to get him off of that life, uh, life sentence to be paroled but then he still caused trouble, so it's very interesting. Now, Corbett Musgrove, uh, the father of the kid, uh, Corbett is the one that was given credit for the killing. Uh, Corbett later became constable of Live Oak, basically, you know, like a police officer in Live Oak, partly because of this, I think. But I talked to my great-grandfather before he passed away about this. They were cousins, basically. And he said, it wasn't Corbett, it was Jim, his dad. Uh, Corbett was kind of a not, not the kind of guy that would scare you with a gun. So it's probably his, his dad, Jim, which I guess would have been maybe a first cousin or something of my great-grandfather. But anyway, interesting story and, and the family part of it's kind of funny. But then it happened 1934, downtown, and you got a shootout. Kind of like OK Corral type stuff, but, but downtown. So that one's interesting. A lot of lawlessness going on. Three years later, we have another murder. This is uh, the murder of O.O. O. Hurst. And I always forget which one because there were two brothers. One is O.Z. Hurst, O-Z-I-E. The brother, twin brother, I'm assuming, is Ozzy, O-Z-Z-I-E. So one's got one Z, one's got two. He goes by O.O. O. Hurst in the records. And I have to go back and see which one it was. But Ozzy or O.Z., whichever one it was, uh, was killed by a group of men, uh, Harry Wadsworth, Harvey Stewart, Arthur Smith, some other folks uh, were involved. Uh, they basically ran him off the road. He had his family inside with him, ran him off the road, and shot him dead. Now, the story with it, I, I've met family on both sides. So I met his family, and I met some of the murderer's family, and they've both been interested in it. Uh, it's an interesting case. I actually still have the bullets from this murder at the courthouse. And I will bring them out to show kids uh, when we have uh, tour groups come through. Because one of them is you know, taken from the solar plexus. So I ask them if they know where the solar plexus is. I think one time one person knew because they were like a nurse in a previous life kind of thing. Uh, but pretty much nobody else knows. So around the gut, basically. Uh, that muscle around the gut. But I show them and I talk about the murder a little bit and just show them some of the, the types of things that we still have at the courthouse. Uh, but yeah, we've got those bullets. And there's a lot to this story. And as I've talked to different sides and different folks and gone through the records, it sounds like it boils down to 
this Hurst, <clears throat> let's see, he married a woman that already had kids. And they're one of these kids, the oldest daughter, I believe the oldest daughter anyway, upper teenage. She got pregnant and married one of these guys that murdered him, the boy. But then the boy claimed it wasn't his, and it was probably the stepdad, Mr. Hurst, that had, had done it. And so the boy's daddy got some friends together. We're going we're gonna to take care of him for, for doing that and causing shame to my family. So that's kind of what happened. For what I've read. Very interesting story. Lots of stuff sometimes that you can and can't talk about, but um, it's very interesting. Very interesting. But these guys were found guilty. They served, I think, 20 years in prison for it. Another murder happens a few years later, 1944, January. Willie James Howard. This is one of our uh, well known, unfortunate race related murders. And Willie James Howard was a 15-year-old African-American boy. He was found dead in the Suwannee River. <clears throat> what had happened was he had sent a female co-worker. He, he worked at one of the downtown stores. He had sent a female co-worker, teenage co-worker, basically this letter here, um, a sweetheart letter, if you will, a, a love letter of sorts if you will, saying, you know, I'd like you to be my sweetheart, and I'll read it to you in a minute. But he sends that to her. She shows her dad. Her dad is a politician. He works in the post office. Uh, a businessman, he's very big in the community. And um, his name is, is Mr. Goff. And he doesn't take too kindly to that. So he gets a couple of his friends. They go, and go down to the store, and they get Willie. They go and get Willie's dad. And they take him to the Swanee River out by Swanee Springs, and they have a little discussion with him. His friends are also very prominent businessmen and such, and they claim they want to teach the boy a lesson. And so what they say is, according to the testimony, they tied him up to keep him away from running, and then they told the dad to punish him, to whip him, something like that. And Willie said, my dad isn't going to whip me, and he jumped into the river and drowned. That was what the official story was. That's what their sworn statements were. That's what Willie James Howard's dad's sworn statement was, that that's what had happened. Well, the next day, um, Willie James Howard's parents leave Swanee County and never return kind of thing. They, they go down south, and um, he's able to testify more freely, and he says basically the three white men had given his son either the chance to be shot or to jump in the river and drown, and he jumps in the river and drowns. Um, and the family never returns to Swanee County. It's an issue, it's a big deal. Uh, this is actually the original letter that was written. And basically, I'll see if I can read it from here without blocking too much, but it says, Dear friend, just a few lines to let you know, uh, let you hear from me. I am well, as hope you are the same. This is what I said on that Christmas card from WJH, Willie James Howard, with, a, uh, with L, excuse me, with L, so with love. I hope you will understand what I mean. That is what I said. Now, please don't get angry with me because you can never tell what may get in somebody. I didn't put it in there myself. God had and you can't help with uh, what he does can I? I know you don't uh, I guess, think much of our kind of people but we don't hate you all we want to be your all friends uh, but you want you won't let us I guess is what he's saying please don't uh, let anybody see this I hope I haven't made you mad if I did tell me about it and I will forget about it I wish this was a northern state. I guess you call me fresh. Write and tell me what you think of me, good or bad. Sincerely yours from YKW uh, to Cynthia Goff. P.S. I love your name. I love your voice. For a SH, sweetheart, you are my choice. So he wrote that. That's what a black boy wrote to a white girl. And that's what got him killed. Uh, 
Unfortunately, during this era of racial inequality, there were lots of attempts at justice by the family and politicians and friends. No one was ever charged for that murder. Even petitions to the governor of the state made it nowhere. And there were prominent civil rights lawyers that got involved, people like on the left, Thurgood Marshall, who later became the first African-American Supreme Court Justice in the United States. He was involved in it. And also Harry T. Moore, the guy on the right, who was big into the NAACP and for, for uh, justice. And Harry T. Moore was killed in 1951 uh, by another race-related event. Harry T. Moore was from Swanee County. He was not killed in Swanee County, but that's where he was from. He was from here. So they tried to get justice, and it never happened. Now, the daughter apparently was upset about what her dad did, and from what I was told by one of her friends, uh, before she passed on, she uh, had a nervous breakdown because of it. So she was upset over what had happened. Uh, but it's very unfortunate. It's just one of those racially things that's never been fully resolved. Of course, everybody's dead now. Not long thereafter, the year after, September of 1945, we have another race-related murder here in Suwannee County. And this was from Tom Cruise, who was a constable in Suwannee County, but also the town marshal of Branford. And he took a black army veteran by the name of Sam McFadden into custody. Now, according to the, the records and according to what we can find out, basically, uh, Cruise took him into custody because McFadden had disrespected him somehow. And so he whipped McFadden, and he forced him to jump at gunpoint to Swanee River, where he drowned. He apparently could not swim, so he drowned. So a local grand jury here refused to indict the constable and town marshal, didn't indict him, and so there were no criminal charges, but because of law changes, they were able to file some civil charges, and a cruise was fined one year in prison and $1,000 for violation of McFadden's civil rights. I would think killing somebody definitely would have done it. So this is where the court reverses the Cruz decision. It says a three-judge federal court of appeals yesterday reserved this decision after hearing counsel for Tom Cruz, former Swanee County Constable, asked for a reversal of a one-year prison sentence given Cruz on a charge of violating the civil rights of a Negro. The sentence, maximum under the law, <clears throat> was imposed in the U.S. District Court here last October after a jury convicted Cruz of violating the 14th Amendment in connection with the death of Sam McFadden, Swanee County Farmhand. Charles Cook Howell, Cruz attorney, told the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals yesterday that the constable was not acting in his official capacity or with specific intent when he allegedly shot the Negro, or beat, me, beat the Negro with a horse whip until he jumped in the Swanee River and was drowned. District Attorney Herbert S. Phillips said the government have presented ample proof that Cruz used his official role as constable to cloak the action and place a Negro under virtual arrest. Civil rights charge only one under which the federal courts could take jurisdiction, developed after a Swanee County grand jury had refused to indict Cruz on state charges in connection with McFadden's death. So folks here didn't take care of it, so the federal court had to take care of it. And that's all they could charge him with, basically. It's a very sad, very sad uh, time in our history where the race relations were not what it should be and where the law was not very fair. <clears throat> Moving ahead just a few years, we've got another murder. And this one I have talked about an entire presentation work. Ruby McCollum murdering Dr. Clifford Leroy Adams. <clears throat> August 1952. She walks into his doctor's office across the street from the courthouse. That's what, the third thing now? Across from the courthouse? <laughs> and shot him dead <clears throat> in the back and then left. The argument it appeared to be was about money, about a bill. And he was found, Dr. Adams was found with money in his hands. And so the initial thought was, well, she killed him over a charge. Well, she and her husband were the richest African Americans in town, had lots of money. And come to find out as you start going through and digging through it, uh, there's a lot more to the story. Ruby McCollum's husband was Sam McCollum, Belita Sam, basically running an illegal uh, Belita or numbers lottery game. And they were well off. Dr. Adams 
was a frequent visitor to their house. Um, and then you get into a lot of hearsay about what may or may not have happened, but the gist of it is basically Dr. Adams was taking money from them as a bride of sorts. He also was the father of uh, Ruby's last child. Supposedly she was pregnant again. Don't know for sure if that was true. But she shot him because basically Dr. Adams was having nothing more to do with her. And uh, that's one side. The other side is she was tired of him having his way with her. So it depends on who you talk to, what you look at. Like I said, I do a whole presentation on this we looked at a few months ago. I'm not going to reiterate the entire thing. But she was found guilty, sentenced to death, but then they overturned it on a technicality because the judge did not go with the jury to the scene of the crime. And so it was turned over, overturned. And by this point, she was no longer fit mentally to go to trial. So she basically was put into a mental institution over in Chattahoochee until she would be fit. And she never was fit enough to stay in trial. And then she was eventually released 20 years later and lived out the rest of her days back where she was from originally down in the Ocala area, but she always wanted to come back home to Swanee County. So again, there's a lot to that story. It's a very difficult issue. I mean, lots of stuff coming out, um, a lot of things. And we talk about it in detail in that presentation that I do just on that. But Dr. Adams was not the saint that a lot of people made him out to be at that time. My great grandparents, who were some of the witnesses to Ruby going in, when you read the court transcript, they see her walking back and forth. And I talked to them over the years before some of them passed on. And they thought of him as a saint still. It's like, don't talk about that woman that killed my dear doctor. So uh, you know, even 20 years ago, 15 years ago, there were a lot of folks that knew Dr. Adams, or thought they knew Dr. Adams, and saw him as a benevolent, kind doctor who made house calls. And it wouldn't always take your money. He'd done lots of other stuff. He was... Lots of stuff that he did that was bad. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's one of those fun stories. There have been books written about it. There have been movies that have come out about it. Uh, lots of stuff about it. But that was Dr. Adams in the picture. I don't think I told you, but that was Dr. Adams there. And the woman there is Ruby McCollum. I know descendants from Dr. Adams. I know descendants from Ruby McCollum. So it's interesting sometimes. Especially when you see them interact and they're cordial and stuff they do their, their business and, and move on. So it's, it's very interesting how that works out. Uh, but yeah, that's one of those, those big ones. Lots of people knew about it. Uh, yeah. Moving on, a couple decades. Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. 1978. He was captured in Florida after a vicious murder spree. Um, he was arrested. He was charged with lots of crimes, lots of murders. His last victim was 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, who was from Columbia County. She was taken from school over there. Her body was found in Suwannee County, uh, close to the Suwannee River State Park, close to Stagecoach Road. <clears throat> and uh, took eight weeks to find the body. So she was found. His other victims right before that had been in Tallahassee, the Kai Omega murders. He had killed several students. And the brutality that he had murdered them, uh, it was pretty bad. But he also left bite marks and such, which allowed prosecutors to determine it was him and to arrest him and charge him. And he was found guilty. So he'd already been found guilty of the Kai Omega murders, and then he was put on trial here in Suwannee County for the murder of Kimberly Leach. <coughs> and uh, it started November 7th in the upstairs courtroom, but very quickly there was a change of venue, and he was moved down to Orlando, which is where the trial, the rest of the trial was held. He was found guilty, sentenced to death. We don't know how many people he killed. He's one of our most famous serial killers in Florida and Swanee County, and, well, not Swanee County, but the country. 29 people, 100 people, we don't know. The normal number they throw out is 35. They're pretty confident of 35, but he could have killed a whole lot more. Starting from the time he was a teenager. So, uh, 
It's interesting. He was very charismatic. I believe he proposed in his uh, trial to a woman who accepted. Um, crazy stuff. He served as his own attorney at one point. Even the, the, the judge said, you know, if you had gone a different way, you would have been a great attorney. But you took this, this course of action instead. So he was sentenced to death, executed in Florida in 1989. I was home sick from school when that happened. So I remember coming on TV talking about he had been executed. Uh, he kind of pushed off the execution a few years because he would get close to the execution date and he would say, hey, I'll tell you where another body is if you'll let me live a little longer. And he kept doing that until finally they said enough's enough. Let's get rid of him. So he was executed and bye-bye Ted Bundy. Last thing I want to talk about happened in 1995, October 20th, and that was the Swanee Democrat burned again. Devastated. The building in that part of the block of downtown Lido was burned down by an arsonist. So we've got two arsons, Swanee Democrat, 90 years apart, losing lots of records. Pretty much the newspapers were burned up. All of them they had were burned up. We were fortunate because by that point they had started microfilming some of them. So the University of Florida Library, uh, George Smathers Library has some. We've got some in our office at the courthouse and there's some others on microfilm out and about. But there are still several decades worth that are gone. The ironic thing with this is the next week the Swanee Democrat was sending off all their newspapers to get microfilmed. So they would have a copy of them. The arsonist struck a little too quickly. Bad timing. Another funny story with this is uh, I found out I had cancer in 2000 and uh, went through several years of treatments, radiation, chemotherapy, surgery. And my orthopedic surgeon, the one who uh, worked on my arm and such and took out the tumor, uh, he said, yeah, I, I've dealt with somebody from Lido. He basically dealt with the arsonist and or his spouse because one of them had cancer, and so he's like, yeah, I heard a little bit about that, and so we talked about it way back to like 2000 and stuff about it, because so, it was pretty fresh still then. But very interesting, because he, he helped save this person's life or his spouse's life uh, from cancer too, so interesting. But yet another loss of Swanee County's history with that burning, and we've had lots of others. I mean, I, I could talk a lot more than I already have about crime in Swanee County. I don't think we've got any more than anybody else. I think we've got less than some places. What you find going through our records at the courthouse, the clerk's records, is the late 1800s and early 1900s seem to be a very lawless time. And that just, lots of different reasons. Reconstruction, race relations, we were growing by leaps and bounds, lots of newcomers coming in. The old guard was kind of trying to uh, keep their status, but they couldn't out with the old and with the new. Lots of different changes with technology. Uh, you've got wars, you've got things like that. So, so lots of crime. Again, it's very interesting to study them from a historian standpoint. It's funny when I'm related or have, you know, somehow related to it. That's always fun uh, for me to find out about this relative or that relative sometimes. And, I mean, my four great grandfather, the Herald that moved here, he was charged with attempted murder in the 1870s. So some of that documentation is of the courthouse. Uh, from what I've been told by family, basically, and, and reading through some of the existing records, he caught his wife in bed with another man. So uh, you never know. I mean, there's all kinds of stories out there. You never know. Try to kill somebody with an ax. And he absconded, fled the county. He would come visit his wife at night sometimes. I know where she's buried, who knows where he is. So, so I mean, you dig your own history, your own family history. Not everybody is a saint in your family. And I've got lots of them that were not. So that's kind of a fun part for me as a historian to go through and learn about so and so. My dear whatever. Not always so dear as, as they appear to be. Anyway, that is the end of crime. Next week, or next month, excuse me, we talk about railroads in Swanee County. So any thoughts, questions, comments? Well, thank you. I'm glad y'all are here. Hope to see y'all next month. Oh, one other thing. 
This week I started after a what three and a half year hiatus, weekly newspaper articles, historical articles. Uh, when the Swanee Democrat folded in 2020, that was it for a while, and the Lake City newspaper and the Riverman newspaper said, "Hey, can you do it?" I said, "Not for now, but after three years of it, people have been asking me. I've learned more information, I've done more writings, that kind of stuff. So I started back, I guess yesterday, technically." in the Riverbend News. So um, some of them are the old articles, some of them are new articles. Some of them are old articles that have had more additional uh, information put in there. But anyway, y'all like history, y'all are here, so you Make can read about it. Do what? Make it worth buying the There we go. Again. Maybe so. I'd be curious to see if the if the number goes up. It's like, forget this. We're going to throw them away. But I don't know. Anyway, it's in there, and I had done seven years of it before the Sony Democrat shut down. And I've got several more since then. So we'll see how far I can go. But I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you.